Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 230 of the 21st Century Work-Life Podcast, which today, well, we have an episode around what's going on, what's uh, coming up for us for Virtual Not Distant, and also we'll have a topic-based conversation around learning and sharing in remote teams. I'd like to say hello to Maya Middlemiss, who's here with me as co-host. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hello, everybody. So it seems a little bit, um, I don't know, it feels strange today because I don't have my screen that I have around me when I'm recording. So I feel like I've got too much space behind me. But um, my (laughs) husband has the screen because he's on a webinar in the lounge. So uh, a sign of the times, I imagine. Yes, I just had to go and retrieve my headphones from um, a daughter's bedroom where they had made their way over the weekend for some reason. So, yes, we're all sharing stuff at the moment, including bandwidth. (laughs) Yes. So today is the 6th of April 2020. Uh, We are in still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've got some we've got lots of uh, topical stuff that's come up. But actually, we hope it will be uh, evergreen and that this will be relevant regardless and interesting regardless regardless of when you're listening to this. Last week, we didn't have an episode because we thought we'd give the whole world a break from content about remote work. So, um, but uh, let's start with the most, uh, the most recent, recent thing, which maybe by the time this goes out, maybe that's last year's news, I don't know. So uh, what happened to you recently, Maya, at an online event you were attending? Uh, yeah, it's something that happened in an event I was in, and also sadly to lots and lots of people around the world, is that people have been becoming aware of some security flaws in Zoom. Um, to be fair to Zoom, they have done their best to fix this, and a lot of it is down to user error. But yes, what happened to me was I was in a meeting. It was a it was a private meeting, but I think the link was sent to quite a large user list. I don't know how many, um, and there were about fifteen people in the meeting. One of whom didn't contribute or put up an image and had a a clearly unrevealing username, didn't participate in the meeting at all, which was a little bit strange because it was quite an active discussion. And then suddenly at the end of the meeting, their image changed to something hardcore porn and they started bombing the chat with loads of links and comments. Um, So that was very embarrassing for the organiser who managed to kick them out of the meeting quite quickly. But it was my first experience of something called Zoom bombing, which is clearly something that when only a handful of people in business chats used Zoom was not a thing. And now it is a thing. Unfortunately, apparently there are people who have released specific scripts to do this in order to basically brute force passwords and, well, meeting IDs and try and find any live meeting going on and insert themselves into the meeting ready to share whatever they think the world needs to see. Um, And Zoom are responding now. People are criticising them for doing a little bit late, but it has become one of these phenomena that we will sadly remember from this time, I think. The word Zoom bombing has entered the lexicon along with all the other words like um, infection rate and furlough and everything else. So, yeah, uh, I think I really feel for Zoom because they're also in the middle of a pandemic. (laughs) Yes, and they're not a big team. Yes, Um, yes, you you know, you might lose sympathy when you look at their share price, but really they are doing their best to respond to something they didn't expect, just like all the rest of us. And they're a, a team trying to build and secure things. And I know just this weekend they released some updates. So, um, it's, if this gets released in another week, then things could have moved on again. But in the meanwhile, it's just make sure you've got the most up-to-date version of the application running, because I think they are doing their best to cope with this in real time and protect their users as best they can. 
Yeah, so we'll put uh, links to a range of articles in the show notes. One is I really like the message to the users, which said, well, just how popular the app has become and it's taken them by surprise and how this has usually been in the past used by businesses and then suddenly everyone is using it. So I think it was a really good uh, good message from uh, from the CEO. And then we'll put a link also to the recommendations. But anyone with a Zoom account will have received an email with uh, um, with an update of, of all the security recommendations. Yeah, they should have check your spam or something if you haven't got it. Um, there's also been an awful lot of not always terribly well-informed mass media comment on it from people who aren't used to using it at all. And to be fair, these security features have always existed within Zoom. Um, you've always been able to password protect your meetings. You've always been able to have the, the waiting room enabled. So, And people have been sometimes not using best practice themselves, like when the UK cabinet shared, shared screenshots of a meeting image with their meeting ID clearly displayed in the image, for example. Um, don't do that. <laughs> it's a really interesting uh, way of uh, adapting technology at a rushed pace. Yeah. So I think this is a very clear reminder that we can't, when, when we decide to make the transition to online, to remote, we can't assume that everyone knows how to use the tools. We can't assume that everyone knows what the customization um, is, or what, what the default mm-hmm. settings are, and we don't all know how to customize it. So I think from the point of view of a huge learning for anyone who is introducing technology into an organization and I know that this is a li- this is different this is technology being grabbed by everyone anywhere uh, but this is a great yeah. reminder for all of that definitely and I think it's it's an inevitable consequence of the way that these apps are getting easier and easier to use and it's, it's a convergence with the kind of consumer tech that we're all used to you know zoom is as easy to use as something like whatsapp but everybody is using and that means that People can just jump on it, teach themselves. They don't have to read any instructions or warnings or advice. Um, For the most part, that's great and reduces friction and it's keeping the world talking to each other and working together. But it does mean that it's easier for bad actors to act as well. Of course, there are other apps, uh, other video uh, apps, uh, video (laughs) meeting apps out there. And actually, I received as part of the uh, Google Suite um, account that we've got. They uh, they wrote, we're writing to let you know that we've rolled out free access to advanced Hangouts meet video conference capabilities to all G Suite customers globally, including larger meetings for up to 250 participants per call, live streaming for up to 100K viewers within your domain, record meetings to Google Drive, etc. So I think everyone, of course, of course, there is a, a business opportunity here as well, but as well, mm. they're just saying, look, here, here you go. You need it now. We can offer it. We're okay. Our share prices are okay. Here you go. Yeah. And, uh, and, and a lot of companies are doing this. Yes, I'm sure there's additional functionality being made available in Teams. And um, yeah, interestingly, I know a lot of smaller players are quite frustrated by the actions of these big players who can literally afford to give everything away for free right now and just say, right, you can have the full premium product, um, even if it's for a limited period. And that's being seen as a bit of a data grab by some smaller providers. And which brings us on to the next piece which we want to share with you is that we have, we've found a list of, I think it's about 600 different possible video conferencing solutions, just as a reminder that Zoom and Hangouts isn't the only options before you. Yeah, so uh, uh, Maya, you'll stick that in the show notes. Yeah, I think <laughs> that there is an awful lot of possibility out there. And there, you know, there's lots of different ones. Um, it's the same with messaging. You know, I think we're all guilty of the fact that if somebody says, oh, how can I quickly get online and have a meeting with my team. You're just going to go, oh, well, Zoom, you know, <laughs> it's it's so simple. Or I want to have a chat, right? Slack, jump in there. And we recommend the biggest ones without really thinking about what that means for the diversity of the marketplace in future. And perhaps we should be giving a little bit more consideration to what the different niche attributes of these different platforms are. And maybe if we want diversity, once the dust settles, because um, I'm sure there's going to be so many more people working from home long term, are Zoom going to have grabbed a, a really unstoppable market share by giving everything away for free? 
I don't know. So we should look at that. It's a bit like the Amazonification of retail. Mm. Um, are they going to be the only people left selling us things? It's a bit scary. Um, also, because of our community, that's what we hear most also, I think. But for example, uh, 8 by 8 they've been doing something very similar to Zoom. They've also had lots of requests from um, schools in Italy, and they've opened right. lots of accounts. But 8 by 8 is essentially mainly up to now being used by um, um, call centers and people who ha also need to integrate a phone system within them. So different, different markets. I think there's already been some kind of segmentation, but not very much. I mean, like what you're saying, um, that there's the big players. So, um, yeah. yeah, so that's that's also interesting. So listeners, let us know if you have been using an, an, an application to help you work with others online, whether it's a meeting or just a collaboration platform. Let us know because maybe other listeners would like to have a look at alternatives. So virtualnotdistant.com for your long form uh, messages, <laughs> or you can email me, Pilar, P-I-L-A-R, at virtualnotdistant.com or Twitter, virtual teamwork with a zero instead of the O. <laughs> I got it wrong last time. So um, shall, we, shall we move on from the Zoom bombing and the uh, video stuff. Yeah, let's, yeah, we yeah, need yeah, to move good. on from that. I, <laughs> I, I wanted to just uh, uh, do a, a shout out to, <laughs> we've had so much content coming out on remote and I just wanted to say hello to Dr. Professor Gloria Ronsbottom, uh, who has um, a, a, an outrageous post about working remotely. So I just like to say satire is still there, still living. Uh, and We need humour wherever we can find it at the moment. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> so again, my I will stick the link to, to, to yeah, that. You need to read it, really. There's no point just trying to explain it. <laughs> so um, a very short one, actually, and it's completely jumping. We're going to jump a little bit now. Um, I listened to an episode of uh, The Writer's Well, <laughs> which Trello transcribed as The Write As Well, but not The Writer's Well. Yeah. And it's all about wellness. Um, and um, uh, Rachel Heron, who's one of the podcasters there in episode 165, she talked about a new co-working space she's joined. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's got a spa I think or a, a health uh, lots of health features also I think it's a women's only also somewhere mm. in the US, US I can't remember where and there was well, something I wanted to share with you Maya and listeners is that they have sets of beads a set of black beads which you wear around your neck which you wear around you when you don't want to be disturbed. So this is, again, a, a physical space where we take some visual cues, very similar to what we put in the chat, do not disturb. And I, I really like that. I thought it would be, it'd be worth, uh, worth sharing. How interesting. Yeah, this is like um, our, our Slack emojis coming into real life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. How do we signify do not disturb? Um, it's like a way of hanging a status on you. Yeah, and I like so that. that. People can see it. But yeah. I don't, do we want a beads good? Can you see them across the room? Yeah, yeah. I they're, don't know. they're probably like thick and uh, black, I imagine. And also because it's one one set that you take from the co-working space, and well, <laughs> in normal times, and you put around you, then it's very much everyone knows it's one thing. It's not like everyone's bringing mm. their own beads. So, yeah. So, so, <laughs> Is that just a fashion statement? Yes. Or she busy? Yeah. So consistent and unified vocabulary uh, yes. that they're using. Just like the emojis yes. you need to have, you, you all need to know what it means. I mean, I think the norm up till now in co-working has been an expensive set of noise cancelling headphones mm. is your signal that I'm busy. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. For me, as a committed home worker, it, it reminds me why I do that. And yes. <laughs> sort of like, I want to be able to work without somebody disturbing me. Um, but I haven't got a spa. So, um, <laughs> well, I, I might uh, be wrong. I don't think it was a spa. I think it's just my, my lack of vocabulary regarding any health uh, places. <laughs> well, they, they're definitely there are lots of reasons for going to co-workings and a shout out to the co-working industry who we really hope is going to come through this crisis and still be there for us, um, for people who want to continue to experiment with remote working after this lockdown period. I hope the co-workings are going to do okay. Yeah, yeah, same here. And it reminds me of something someone said in a workshop the other day about many years ago, also having a, a manager who asked them all to put put uh, at their desks uh, green, yellow or red pieces of paper to indicate also availability. So uh, I, I, I love it. I love it when the when the two worlds blend or, 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 or mirror each other. It's funny, isn't it? Again, it's like you were saying, it only works if everyone A, uses it absolutely consistently and B, 
is very, very clear about the meanings. And, you know, it gets to the point where if you have to explain it, then it's, it's easier just to say it. Um, but if if there is that shared understanding, then maybe that could work quite well. It's I've heard like people in yoga classes using some kind of token that if you if you don't if you want the yoga teacher to physically adjust you or if you prefer not to be touched um, so that you can do that. And again, so you can have that conversation in silence without disturbing everybody else. Mm, interesting. Uh, and then I saw another thing I thought I'd, I'd share with you. In uh, It was in the Harvard Business Review. And it's a little bit of uh, research and it's called Passing the Reins to a Robot. And I'll just read it out uh, verbatim. So it says, a majority of people surveyed say they would rather have a laid off co-worker replaced by a human being than by a robot. But if their own jobs were on the chopping block, they'd prefer that a robot take over. It doesn't really <laughs> surprise you, does it? Because if you're going to leave, you might as well be replaced by a, some someone who's not as nice as you. Well, yeah, it's I, I don't know. I think it's the sense that, well, we couldn't compete with a robot. So, yeah, it's not like being replaced by a better human. Yes, yes. Um, oh, it's like the comedy trope of the husband leaving you for another man instead of another woman or something. It'd be like, you know, it's not like I failed because that's something that I couldn't possibly go up against. So it means that, yeah, if the robots are going to come for our jobs, then that's better than another person. I don't know, weird one. I've never really thought about that. Yeah, for me, it makes sense. I, I like that if it's a, a co-worker that they prefer another person. <laughs> that would have been yeah. interesting. <laughs> they prefer the robot to take over their fellow person. Um, so, yeah, this is... a. Uh, called Psychological Reactions to Human versus Robotic Job Replacement by Armin Granulo, Christoph Fuchs and Stefano Puntoni. And that was at the HBR March-April issue. It's Idea Watch. So one of these, they don't go into any more depth. It's just like, a, this is what's going on. That's curious. I think, I wonder if it's also people's perception of what a robot is, if they're imagining <laughs> some kind of thing with a, a face and clunky arms sitting next to them in the office or, or some, whether they're really thinking of some kind of process automation that has no physical manifestation. Yeah, well, that's really important. Yes, I hadn't thought yeah. of that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> That's good. Um, and then we've got uh, uh, two things here. Um, Maya, do you, which one do you prefer to start with the medium post or with the um, uh, mainstream and media use of tech? <laughs> well, the medium post was something I came across a week or so ago. It was an article in the startup um, called the, I hate this headline, it's so clickbaity, the five levels of remote work and why you're probably at level two. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so it sucks to be you. Um, it was an interesting article though, and I, I did click through and have a read, but, and I was impressed beyond the headline. It was by Steve Klaveski writing in the startup, so we'll put a link into that. And I think this is probably quite an important read for teams who are transitioning, especially all the teams we know that are transitioning at breakneck speed right now. So um, basically, it was stressing the thing that we we talk about in the, the work we do with teams that it's not a case of trying to replicate exactly what you do in the office. That's not a long term strategy for remote work. And that's where a lot of people are at at the moment. They're trying to replicate exactly what they do. Every meeting, every conversation, every process is basically we're trying to find a way of doing that from home and that that really that's their level two. The, the first level, he's got a level one, is sort of non-deliberate action, which is a polite way of saying complete chaos. Um, and level two is let's replicate this and that. Or we'll find a, an app that does it, or we'll find a meeting or a platform to do it. And the level's going up in this ascending pyramid. Basically, it's the goal of it, his ultimate pinnacle of the pyramid is to reach a time of almost no communication at all or completely asynchronous which is, again, something we've talked about a lot on this show, that asynchronous communication enables you to work remotely without that constant flow of expectation that you have to interrupt what you're doing and respond to things in real time. Um, and for many teams, that is the pinnacle of aspiration. For other kinds of work, I'd suggest it's not, and that you do need some more kind of live communication flow in real time, at least at, at fixed periods. So I'd argue with some of this that this is this is the the ultimate culture where you don't need to have any interaction at all. Um, but it, it's an interesting framework, and I think it's well worth people reading if they're they're trying to maybe adjust to this after a couple of weeks and thinking, 
okay, we've managed to just about get keep everything going. Now, how can we be a little bit more strategic about it? Yeah, we have to remember that it's based on the um, a, another podcast, which I haven't uh, listened to yet with Matt Willenberg from <laughs> Willenberg. I don't know why I gave him a German surname of, uh, of Automatic, <laughs> where they communicate mainly their ideas through blog posts. Uh, yeah. And where we've heard, of, of course, that we've heard them say, some teams are really asynchronous, some teams are more live communication. So I think it very, I picked up on that also at the end that the, the, the nirva, nirvana stage, which they call right at the end, is this, <laughs> yeah, where we're all getting on with our work. Uh, maybe yeah, we don't have to talk yes, to each other. <laughs> so I, I've suggested, so this was really, really useful. So uh, you sent this through, Maya. Uh, Lisette had actually mentioned the, the podcast episode where they talked about it, but I hadn't had time to. So this is really great. And um, I used this this to introduce some to start some of the workshops which uh, that I've been running about just suddenly going remote and it's been very very useful to make clear to people that there is a, if you want to adopt remote work remote collaboration remote teamwork that there's a lot more work to be done and also as a real reassurance to people that this is normal what you're doing and why you're burnt out because you're just going and having meetings online all the time this is also yeah. normal. You've just, <laughs> you now have to change. And I changed. Um, so in I think it was either stage three or four is the one about asynchronous communication. I changed that to asynchronous communication or deliberate synchronous. So we mm -hmm. start to decide yes. that now we need to meet. And then, near, yes. and then Nirvana or the office as another communication tool. Because I think that's, like you said, there will be people who um, want to still have a synchronous communication, there will be teams that still want to use the office for doing some of their activities. And again, for, for me, that should be an option. But I think Nirvana is where the office has become one more place where we do certain kind of work. Yes. And Nirvana is going to look different for every team, for every organization, depending on your circumstances. If you're automatic and you're used to communicating in long form blog posts with each other, then that's what it might look like. You know, everything is done in writing and we don't have to interrupt what we're doing. And then for other people who are at the base of the pyramid, the first time they get everyone together on a Zoom call is, wow, we've, you know, it's an achievement. And that's great. But, you, you know, there are lots of different levels to move up and down in. And also they are global. And I think what yes. we're going to be seeing is that we're going to have more remote teams and remote or distributed organizations in a city. And especially after, you know, with, with all the consequences that uh, that this epidemic is going to have. So, again, people who are uh, working as a distributed organization in one city can probably meet up if that's how they get some certain kind of work done best. If you're global, <laughs> a bit more difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I think that's a really interesting point that there's far more almost temptation to communicate synchronously when you know that you are all in the same time zone, that you're not far from each other. And I think it's also just worth recognising that a lot of people are going to take comfort from level one at the moment because we are all under stress and working in difficult times and maybe we need that daily stand-up or if that turns into something a bit longer or more intimate and disclosing terms, then that's okay at the moment to hang out at that level if that's working for you. Yeah, the meetings at the moment have had a real social uh, aspect and a real reassurance. And we're still here. I can still see you. Okay, that hasn't changed. Uh, yeah. That kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And what is the, the last point? I think uh, I, well, I've got something to say about this also. The last point you're <laughs> making, which is a very timely one, but also I think maybe something that we'll start seeing in different uh, ways. Because this has just accelerated stuff that actually was going to happen at some point but not so quickly and not so soon I was yeah I just thought that I wanted to talk about and to talk talk to you Pilar as another remote person and an audio person about how all the different implications of everybody suddenly using all this stuff and obviously the zoom bombings is one negative thing that we've seen and the people sharing all their zoom selfies at level one of the pyramid is another one and that's all great but it there's been some curious manifestations i was listening to the uk news on the radio this morning because i oh, shouldn't listen to news every morning but I do it this well time you know you want to know what <laughs> things move really quickly yeah. so but i did notice at least five calls were lost because clearly there were issues with the bandwidth or performance of the internet at the moment with everyone working from home. That's one reflection of the sign of the times. Um, there was another one where there was a very experienced and skilled interviewer was having major problems shutting up a senior politician she was interviewing. And it made me realise how much more difficult that would be 
remotely. If you're interviewing someone in the studio, you have all these signals of body language. And and it made me realise that we do take a lot of this yes. stuff for granted, that people know the rules of how to use their tech. Um, I watched Have I Got News For You, again, desperate for a bit of humour amongst the mm. news. Did you watch that? Last yeah, that's week? the like, thought that came to mind when I read this. It was... It was they. It was a really noble attempt at doing live topical comedy um, via something that I don't think it was Zoom. I'm not sure what they were using, but it was really weird. It felt so flat in lots of ways. And I know it's difficult to find humour at the moment, but I felt that the lack of the studio audience certainly really, really hindered it. And yeah. there was also a sense that they didn't quite know what it was a bit like watching some friends have a go at their first Skype call. Yeah. Um, they were all remarking on each other's backgrounds and things like that. That just I don't know. It felt like you were observing a private chat amongst some friends. Yeah. So uh, Have I Got News For You is a very, uh, it's been around for more than a decade. It's a kind of a quiz show, but it's a humor thing about the latest news. And usually there's, uh, it's set up like a, like a competition with one host. So the, the person who's asking the questions, who now is a different person each week. And then two, two pairs, two couples, one of which is led by uh, Ian Hislop and another one by Paul Merton, who's a, a comedian. And, and, it really, a lot of the show relies on the relationship and warmth between Paul Merton and Ian Hislop, who've known for each other for ages, and they kind of support the guest. So the second yes. person in each pair is a guest. And what happened last week was that they did what's usually a studio and, you know, they usually have a really long show, which then needs to be cut off. They they play with the audience quite a bit and, you know, sometimes they really bite. It's really good. And what happened, as Maya's saying, is that they all went online and did it without an audience and without really having practiced that warmth, that rapport online before. Yeah. So those of us who've done who've done transitions and, and, and a lot of people now who know that it's one thing to meet together in, in a co-located space, sharing the same physical space and another online, that rapport changes. The way in which you interact changes. And I don't think they had enough time to warm up in this yeah. It is just interesting, though, for those of us who are used to this kind of collaboration technology to see it in use in so many different contexts. And yes. I think it can hopefully make us better at supporting new users by seeing what you take for granted playing out in different ways. Even sitting there um, sort of second guessing it. I was watching Channel 4 News last week and trying to work out whether Krishna Gurumethi was in the studio or not because he had a backdrop of the studio. <laughs> but it was just slightly too artifacty and the lighting didn't quite seemed to work and we were arguing at home saying well he's in the street no I don't think he is and then at the end his dog jumped on his lap oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh great he is at home wonderful, wonderful. and there's his dog so that was lovely well, with that image of uh, a homely uh, scene <laughs> going into work let's uh, move on to what's going on at Virtual Not Distant We're nothing without you, listeners. Send us your thoughts through the contact form at virtualnotdistant.com. So, Maya, the first thing I wanted to uh, to just share very quickly with listeners is that as a company that releases content regularly about remote work, we've been thinking how much more should we put out there? Mm. Uh, and that's and that's something that we discussed also with uh, Tim Burgess and uh, Brie Kajati, who are uh, leading the Connection and Disconnection in Remote Teams series at the moment. And we decided, you know, to, to give everyone a week off <laughs> from content because there has been so much that I'm just thinking, you know, we've got so much anyway. So that's a conversation that, that we've been having at Virtual Not Distant. So listeners, if at this point you would like a recommendation on where to find plenty of content on working remotely, Rowena Hennigan and Robert Kropp, who are previous and future guests of the show, they are curating high quality resources over at remoteworktree.com. But why don't we hear directly from them? Hi, my name is Rowena Hennigan and I am based in Zaragoza in Spain. Uh, I've just uh, called Robert Kropp in Barcelona. We haven't ever actually met before, but we've been working on a fantastic project together 
for about the last month. Uh, we've known each other online. We've connected through the remote community for about a year, I think. And we've developed something called Remote Work Tree, remoteworktree.com, which is an online resource for remote work resources and events and lots of other things. But I'll let Robert introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks, Rowena. Uh, this is Robert Kropp. You can find me at robertkropp.com. Yeah, so Rowena and I, uh, she, <laughs> we got together very collaboratively and uh, just decided one day that, okay, we were all going through a crazy change with COVID-19 and massive remote working happening everywhere around the globe. And we just wanted to figure out a way to ease this transition. There's just way too many people moving in that direction. And uh, we wanted to build something to help. Uh, so what we've done is uh, we've basically, we've built remoteworktree.com to curate and bring together the best like resources and then any type of live events that are coming on, like webinars online, and just bringing it all together. Super clean, super easy to use, and new content's being added frequently. And also we've created like a very tailored section so you can find specifically what you want very, very fast. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Anything you want to add on that, Rowena? Yeah, just to say that I think the learning path that we've added, Robert, is really good. So we've tried to predict that someone logging onto the site would either be an individual interested in remote work or a manager or a leader. And they can follow that distinct path in terms of learning and resources that we present to them under different categories like the basics and then as they develop further. And there's so many different types of resources in there that we've curated right through from templates to webinars to articles. And also they can just access the general resources section to look at some more. So yeah, it's been a really collaborative project and it's crazy to sort of think that four weeks ago, the site didn't even exist. And now yeah. we're, yeah, it's mad. And now we're at the stage that we actually can reach out to the remote community, Robert, and ask them to help us keep the site updated and maintained. One thing we've we've done to help is uh, we have an ability for you know others as well to add you know new events or you know let us know if there's other pieces of content they think would be valuable for the people that are using our site. But again, it's like we we try to keep it as clean as possible uh, because we know there's just so much content out there and content overload is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we, uh, and that's something that I think Rowena and I have chatted about a number of times is just keeping it varies to the point, but also incredibly useful. And yeah, I would agree. It's definitely a bit wild. What, four weeks ago, I was flying back from the US and you were working your way back, and now we're locked down in Spain. Uh, and we're continuing to work remotely. We're recording this remotely. And Hopefully, we're using the things that we've learned. <laughs> uh, I think we have, but I think that's that's pretty much it from uh, Remote Work Tree. And uh, hope that uh, you all find it helpful. And definitely leave us some feedback if you want to see anything else. I was delighted to be interviewed, Maya. By a listener. <laughs> I was so chuffed with... Uh, so Alex Wilson Campbell, hello, hello, host of the Remote Work Life podcast over at remoteworklife.io. And uh, I didn't know this until we started recording, but actually he's been listening to the show for ages. So wow. I was like, wow, so hello, Alex. <laughs> that was really, really nice. Listeners, if you have a podcast and you want us to be on it, we'd be delighted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> really nice to meet listeners. Um, listeners, send us pictures of yourself. <laughs> uh, the, the, and also just the one thing that we um, just bit one other bit of content that we uh, have put out is um, the part four of the book online meetings that matter so online meetings that matter is a guide for managers of remote teams and it talks about uh, the principles behind meetings uh, it talks about all sorts of stuff and the last chapter is about the kit and mm -hmm. the kit of course you person are part of that kit so it's it's a little bit more technical it's also a bit more general so not manager specific which is why we've released it as a one-off thing i haven't quite got it to be free on the kindle store but you can get it from our website and from any other um ebook uh, yeah. store for free we'll put um, the link to the blog post explaining yeah. it um because yeah. I, I think um Pilar's book about meetings couldn't be more timely for the managers who are struggling to deal with this and people moving up through the levels of the pyramid but i would imagine there is an unusual number of people now more than we expected 
basically flicking to the back. The, how do I yes. how do I just do this this morning? Um, and that's what you need this section for. So please grab your copy of that. <laughs> yes. And also, and to be honest, I think the, the book, which has been borrowed a lot as an ebook in libraries, I am really, mm -hmm. really pleased about that. It's also a long read. Yeah. So it's might, it might be something that people don't get to properly for another three or four months when they really have the time because it was written like yeah, that. It you was need written, to dig in. Yeah, yeah, it was written for that. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. And then I have one reflection that I wanted to share with you and uh, listeners, Maya. And so one of the pieces of work I've been doing recently has been for a, a, a large global uh, NGO. And... They wanted just something now. <laughs> I think it took us a week to get it booked. And then it took us another week to get another uh, couple of them booked because the first one had gone down so well. And it instead of doing a workshop, which is what, um, what we usually do, it was a webinar. And I haven't done a webinar for ages. This is how I started in the online space with slides mm -hmm. <laughs> and people uh, uh, contacting and talking to each other via the chat and me being like this, this channel through which uh, people went through. So this is what it was. It was so that we could do it globally, so connectivity wouldn't be an issue, so that we could have as many people, I think there were about a maximum 40. And we did it in Teams, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is not a webinar platform, but it worked quite well because you can mute people. I mean, you can use it as a webinar platform now. They've, they've changed it so you can do that. And the sessions went really well because people wanted to talk. And they only talked on the chat but they were really talking. They were expressing what was going on. They were contributing what they were already doing. And I thought it's so interesting to go just for, to, to basically speak somewhere and bring all the knowledge that we've acquired, blah, blah, blah. But actually the real value was when I asked, what are you doing at the moment to stay in touch with team members or what are team members doing to stay up to date with what each is working on? And then the breadth, that came from that and the specific stuff specific to that organization because uh, I've got lots of ways in which I would love everyone to work remotely but <laughs> <laughs> uh, culture specifics etc so I just wanted um, also listeners to reflect on that that we can have a, something very old-fashioned like a webinar and then but just make sure that it's still a facilitation tool and, and know when people need to be talking to each other and learning from each other, the topic of today's episode, and when actually they need to be a bit more guided, structured and content led. Yeah, and it's similar skills that facilitators have used for a long time, but translating them into the online space isn't automatic. And even just monitoring all those channels when you're, if you're presenting something and then also trying to keep an eye on the chat and everything else, it is a bit of an art form, but it's something that hopefully a lot of people are having to get better at quickly. Yeah, I was I was very lucky because I actually had my my main contact was there with me to support me and to link back mm. to the organization. So there were times and she would say, oh, and by the way, we have this resource or by the way, I have an example. Uh, and that really helped to have an internal person to help yeah. almost translate to something that is completely relevant. And then we even had, get this, two people technically there, uh, sorry, two, two, not technically there, <laughs> they were there, two people, if there were any technical issues, they would deal with that. So I right. mean, it was a really nice setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very good. So yeah, so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Right, and that is a nice segue, <laughs> I say, uh, on to today's topic of learning and sharing in remote teams. Um, what, what comes to your mind, Maya, when we say learning in, in a remote team? Learning in a remote team. Okay, that's really interesting because I think of it in the context of how learning has changed anyway. Well, certainly in my lifetime, and I realise there are people in the workplace for whom this won't be news, but a long time ago, learning used to be something you did at one phase of your life, and then you, you gained your professional qualification, and then you went into your career, and that was kind of the end of that. Whereas as I changed careers somewhat abruptly a few years ago, I, I discovered this fact that you can learn pretty much anything online now, one way or another. There will be content out there. There will be materials and tools. Um, and whether you have to pay for them or not, and it often is worth paying to get to the heart of what you want to learn, somebody will have put that online for you. And that's just exploding at the moment. And I think more and more people are discovering 
the many different ways in which you can access information and learning materials online. And again, that's another thing that's going to be a permanent change in the world, I think. So there's um, that is uh, when we know we need to learn something and the first thing we need is information around it. And so now we can seek that information just in time. Yeah. So just when we need it. And we can also get it from uh, non-official channels. Yes. So we don't need to be in an educational institution to search for that. So in a way, those more formal learning interventions and those more top-down interventions have shifted and now can be accessed in all kinds of ways. They're now not time-specific. So we don't have to go during the day to our to 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 be informed. We can inform ourselves any time. So that is a that's a really interesting way in which uh, that space that space has changed. Learning used to mean we learn about a subject, whereas now we know that learning we learn behaviors, especially at yes. work. We uh, we learn to communicate and all of that. We're learning it all the time. Um, someone said once, "Well, we're learning all the time. What we've got to ensure is that we're learning the right things." <laughs> because yeah, it's and we're not constant. missing a, a big chunk of that by just saying, here's an online resource, go and study it. Yeah, yeah. So so even beyond that, it's in, in organizations, we're learning all the time about how to do things without even being conscious about it. Because if I do something and I get a look, I learn that that's not the way in which we do this. That's all that learning. And I suppose what's interesting is how do we capture that learning when we go as a, when we transform into an online team? when we are remote, when we are away from each other. There's, there's all the informal learning, which, uh, which, is, which is so difficult to capture. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it happens without any kind of noticing almost in the co-located space. We have modelling of behaviours, we have observational learning, and all of these things that happen, particularly when somebody's new to a team and being onboarded, you know, the, the way it used to happen before we had any kind of training and development departments and organisations was go and sit by so-and-so who's been doing this job for a while and you kind of soak it up from watching them and, and watching their behavior and over time things have become much more sophisticated in most organizations but that component that you learn from just observing is much much harder to replicate online. So as always if we don't make space for it and if we're not deliberate about it then uh, it's very well it won't happen just like you're saying because in the co-located we don't even realize it's happening. So I just wanted to learn uh, to to share not to learn. <laughs> well I will learn as well. We're always learning. <laughs> <laughs> always learning and this is one way in which actually we learn. Uh, you always say this uh, Maya is in uh, talking about what we're thinking with others yeah. and talking about what we've discovered and our insights with others. That is one way of learning and uh, and making space for that in an online team is important. Um, my husband's just uh, moved from being a co-located team who also used Trello, <laughs> which he yeah, introduced, into being an online team, uh, as, as, as a lot of people. And they were thinking about the other day that, again, they all, they're all having ideas of how to change the situation, of how to improve the situation but they're not going to be sharing all of those at their 10 o'clock daily meeting that they've got. So they've actually opened a Trello board because it's really easy to put your idea in a Trello card and leave it for later. Mm. So they have a board for their projects and stuff, but now they have one just to dump ideas in and to make sure that they're all captured in some shape or form. So I find that that's a really good way of asynchronously building what we are thinking, ideas for projects, uh, and and then having that and using that to to learn from each other also. Yeah, it's like a notice board or in, the, in, in a co-located office that might be a pin board or something. You could just catch an idea and put it somewhere where people can see it and maybe spark off it and respond to it as and when without it being an agenda item. And it, that's a really important thing to have built into their team that might be missing from when they shared a physical space. And from the point of, uh, for or, you know, our, our connection and disconnection series that we've got about the dangers of isolation when we work away from each other, just having that idea, capturing that idea as an idea mm -hmm. and capturing it as an idea that we might want to share then, of course, it's the value of it goes beyond learning or, or building on it. it. It adds to that sense of connection. And we go to that board, which is not my board, it's our board. Yes, yeah. I think there's a sense of the team ownership of the ideas and the connections. I was talking to somebody last week, actually, who's built a Slack app or Slack bot um, 
which they they built for use within their own team and have now released. And what it does is it it makes a weekly digest of, of posts you've missed. It's to support the more asynchronous, noise-free work environment on a very busy team. They have a system of upvoting posts so that you get a digest of all the posts that you've missed or the top 10 posts of the week. And the idea of this was it's not about what the management or hierarchy think is important, but it's what the team has surfaced as important by upvoting. So you can pick up on those little kind of cultural or funny or interesting or quirky things without feeling that you've got to sit on the channel all day. And I thought that was quite a nice way of sharing learning and sharing ownership of it, of distributing information. And learning about the culture and what's happening. Yes, because if you were new somewhere, that would tell you so much, wouldn't it, about the organisation, not what HR have told you is important, but yeah. <laughs> seeing what, the, what matters to the team. And also because things change, uh, our values don't, but our behaviors do. And actually, sometimes our values also change. So, for example, at a time like this, that would be quite interesting is to see, okay, what are we really thinking now? Yes. What's, how has that conversation shifted? Um, what does that digest look like compared to a month ago? Um, what are we sharing? Mm -hmm. So, of course, something also that I've, uh, as I've been talking to all kinds of companies who, or people from companies who were not ready to go online. Uh, and of course, uh, teams and companies need to start to be ready. The culture needs to be ready. And a lot of the people that have had to make this shift were not ready. So I've been getting all the, the pushback um, against these ideas like, okay, well, then you're capturing um, because all this information is being captured. And it's really, you then have a record of what's going on. And so, so it's also to to remember that these kind of things will work better in some places than others and mm -hmm. that you've got to know how used you are, one, to saying stuff that then gets uh, actually um, to, to share ideas and then nothing happens because it's not the right idea for the team or the whatever, the group at the moment. And also uh, just to know that some people do not want to share half-baked ideas or, or learning stuff like that. They're not ready. So interesting. It, it's part of that going from two to three to four to five stage. It is. And also just about the culture of the team and the psychological safety to share a half-baked idea and to feel that it's it's quite safe to surface that and that people will nurture it with you and build on it positively instead of saying, nah, that's rubbish. <laughs> yes, move on. Yeah. And and from the manager's point of view, the team leader's point of view, to role model some of that, mm. to not always share the perfectly shaped, framed idea that actually you've been <laughs> thinking for three weeks or something, but also to role model some of that, you know, we're, we're really, and also you don't know, sometimes an idea is a bit like, oh, and actually someone else might have one bit of information or insight that you're yeah, missing and to turns it. it on its head. Yeah. And it's the thing that saves you over the next month. Yes. And mo role modeling that vulnerability to share something that you're not quite certain about or confident about and to invite co-creation and improvement. Um, I think ideas are just so important at the moment and creative problem solving that anything, the organisations that will come through this more strongly will be those that really support that in each other and have the best chance of surfacing the good stuff if they pull everybody's minds together to solve problems. Uh, so in addition to that, so a nice Trello board, and it's another, there's a little technique uh, that uh, we've talked about before that Johan Lilich's team came up with, and it's this direct acronym. And it's a way of surfacing information that might have got lost during the day. So as individuals, we do lots of stuff during the day in our work. We think lots of stuff. And some of that we don't pay attention to. And some of that we, we don't share, even though it could be of interest. But we can't share every single thing that goes on in our mind. And so um, we uh, we talked to Johan on an episode that Maya will put the link out. I don't have the episode number uh, with me. And it's this framework called Direct, which is about checking in whenever we need to and, and in whatever form we want to. It could be, again, asynchronous or it could be as part of a meeting, whatever, where we think if we've done one of the following things. Have we made a decision mm -hmm. lately uh, that might affect the team or that we are proud of? Have we had an insight? Have we had a result we want to share? Have we felt an emotion that has affected us? Have we made a connection or a contact that could benefit our team? Have we had any troubles that other people could help us with? And finally, is there anyone we'd like to thank? Mm -hmm. And I really... 
I mean, this I love this framework. I always uh, <laughs> incorporate it into any session when I can. But I think in times also like at the, at the present when we've got loads of stuff on our mind, just to give a little framework for the ideas to land somewhere and to help us think through everything, I think it's really sweet. Yeah, we need to be sharing this one again a lot, I think, because for people who don't know what they're supposed to talk about in an online team, if it's not about the work, um, this gives something to kind of make it okay to share about the insights or the thoughts or the connections or the emotions and everything else that might be bubbling up, but people aren't quite certain, is this, is this appropriate? I would have said it if we were in the office together, but yeah. should I be typing it? Uh, and of course, we can do audio as well, but may, let's face it, most of the asynchronous communication definitely uh, is, is happening um, via text. So another thing is that this acronym works well in Spanish also. Yay! <laughs> Although it's called Directa. <laughs> <laughs> instead of direct with two T's for the right. app. But yeah, but it works well. And uh, in fact, the, the person that I was mentioning earlier that I've worked with on the webinars, she, after the first webinar, adopted it in her team because she said they had a round of things that had gone well, like little little bits, little successes they'd had during the day, just to, you know, because of course it's so difficult at the moment. And she found that actually sometimes someone would have not had a success all day because they've been struggling and uh, they needed something more open. And she found that this, mm. and this just about covers everything. It invites you to share anything you, that's important for you at that moment, I guess. And, and, and I think it's part of visible teamwork also. I mean, this is something we look at when we look at open conversations, but it is part because it's part of your thinking. It's a visible thinking. It's thinking out loud mm. in, a, in a way. So I think I, um, I invite you to... Uh, did you put the ICYMI Slack bot now in the Trello or earlier? Yes, I just okay. added that. No, I just added it now because it, it bubbled up when we were talking about Excellent. it and I didn't want to, to forget that I'd mentioned it. Yes, because I thought, did I miss that? Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad I didn't. No, no, we talked about it and then I put it in. <laughs> so listeners, we use Trello uh, for our um, show notes for now and I've got it in front of me and I just saw that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's nice. Hey, look, <laughs> the thinking is captured immediately. We're doing our visible teamwork <laughs> and working out loud at each other even while we're talking to you. <laughs> So those are the most, uh, the more informal. There's also a, li a little bit of learning together more formally. Um, one is uh, more what we were talking earlier. So maybe something we've learned about that we can easily share some information or, or a, a tool we've learned. Also, there's a lot of tech, tech sharing. I think learning about technology when we're introducing these tools, I think it's often left too much to IT to teach us how to use the technology in the way that it was designed to be used. Whereas in the team and individually, we learn how to use it in different ways. And it's nice to share that because that's how we're going to make it work for us. Yeah. And often, I mean, the kind of tools that we're talking about in use now for remote collaboration, they are so rich and complicated. And there are so many different ways that, you know, there's, nobody ever has to use every single function of Microsoft Teams. I mean, what, what possible role could you be doing where you need everything in there? So instead, Teams is producing templates for different industries and things. So learning how to use the bit that you need to use and the way you need to use it might be best explored very locally with people in your team using it in the same way as you, rather than going to a, a telephone directory size user manual of what, what are all the things this tool can do. And also you might discover customization at an organizational level that you didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, like whether private channels are um, available, whether how private what you're writing is, etc., and how different things talk to each other. So all of that you will find out as you use it, and it's it's nice to share it. Yeah, I think companies are getting better at that now. There are tools for kind of capturing like tool tips and just in time kind of information and learning that people can discover as they onboard themselves into new applications. And the, the more advanced IT teams are doing that rather than saying, come to us when you want to ask something. It's how could we build that learning right into the moment when they discover that they need uh, it. And then... More about the sharing, finding a, a space for learning and sharing, the latte and learn, which we haven't talked about for ages, mm -hmm. which are the very informal sessions, uh, which would be the equivalent of having coffee and just talking about something we've done recently, like if we've been to a conference or read a book, an article, and but giving the space also so that other people can 
not just hear us talk about it, but also hear it, think about what it means to them, ask you questions to help you maybe get take a, get more out of that learning. So it's a real, it's trying to find how the learning can be um, the trigger for a richer conversation, I think. Mm. Even the way it makes you reflect on what you've learned yourself, if you have to try and explain that to somebody else or lead a discussion on it, you can often find things that you didn't know you learned yeah. just by reflecting on that. You don't need a presentation or anything. This is this is that, that medium where you just need to prepare what you want to share and just that preparation without having uh, the, the added thing. So, um, But I think you're right in just preparing what it is you want to share. That in itself is very valuable. Yeah. And the learning itself can still be social. You know, if you find an online course or a video or something, you can watch it together, talk about it together, like your Netflix house party. You can do something like that in the workplace, you know, through a video call or agree to meet up and discuss a piece of content afterwards. You can still, you're not going on a course together in a formal way that you go off to a venue and do something for a day, um, but you can still find ways to make that a learning together experience where it amplifies and cascades the bits that are important and relevant for you and your team. That's a great idea. I would never have thought of that, of sitting down and watching it with, along with someone else, which which people would. Yeah, yeah. And for some yeah. people, it might be just what they need to just finally sit down and watch it. I suppose the only thing I'd want to add in terms of going out and finding learning for yourself and online materials is just be a discerning customer. There is so much out there from the list of how to work from home tips to really in-depth, expensive paid learning products. Um, and to an extent, people are having to find their own way through it. So all you can do is is be just imagine you're, you're shopping for a high, a high price consumer item or something, read the reviews, get as, as much as you can for free to really evaluate it first. And then finally, the any kind of retrospective, any kind of debrief, looking back, that um, and and make that really about the learning rather than understanding. Uh, well, you could make it about understanding how successful you were, but also what is all the learning around it? And the learning that I think often gets lost is what happened between us. Mm-hmm. What did we learn about how we operate? Is there anything we want to change? And more importantly, which we always forget. What are we doing really well that we want to make sure we sustain? And uh, just identifying that, uh, th- that kind of learning. Yeah, I think it's too easy whether things have gone well or badly. Um, we can overlook the good, what, what made it good. We can be very focused on the celebrating instead of actually capturing what we want to replicate here. Um, what was it that made, made that project go so brilliantly? And uh, the same when things haven't gone well. There can either be a sense of, right, let's move on, um, Mm -hmm. or that any kind of digging into it is going to be blaming and punitive, and neither of which helps you learn and do things differently in the future. Yeah, excellent. And so listeners, we invite you to share different ways in which your team is learning. What are some of the things that, you, that you're that you doing now, maybe, uh, if you're spending more time online with each other, that you're, th- that you're doing to, to make sure that as you're growing as individuals, you're also still growing as a team. So we'd love to hear from you, virtualnotdistant.com. You can email me directly, pilar at virtualnotdistant.com, or send us a tweet. We love tweets on virtual teamwork where the O in work is a zero. So uh, listeners, (laughs) listeners will leave you with the stock outro. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Orti, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.